Uh, my presentation will briefly uh, cover a few key topics. Firstly, I'll, I'll reflect a bit on the transformation uh, the industry has been through recent years. Uh, looking at the MOM projections, they have been revised up and we expect this trend to continue. Uh, developers have reached most of, uh, reaped most of the benefits uh, so far. Going forward, we expect this to change with particularly oil major strategic entry having made life harder for incumbents. Uh, meanwhile, we do see an improvement for the supply chain uh, with the turbine manufacturers particularly well positioned in our view. Uh, so starting with the offshore wind market, it currently has installed capacity of around 50 gigawatts, mainly located in China and the North Sea, generating some 160 to 180 terawatt hours of electricity per year. So it's a sizable market. And based on the current project pipeline and government targets, we see market growth of around 10, 20% over the next decade, which makes it the most rapidly growing renewables market. So what's the rationale for offshore wind? Historically, the primary reason has been uh, to put turbines out of sight. So few like to have a giant noisy turbine in their backyard or here in Norway in the nearby uh, mountain where wind conditions tend to be best. You also have uh, uh, good wind speeds uh, near densely populated areas. So offshore, it blows 70 to 100% more than onshore, much more constant. So the resource is really good. While uh, the majority of the most densely populated city er cities um, uh, are um, along the coastline. The last point, uh, and the one that has changed a lot over the recent years, is that it's no longer particularly expensive. So that has resulted in demand projections being revised uh, substantially up, uh, and we now expect to be uh, where we thought we would be in 2040. We now expect we'll be there in 2030 uh, uh, at current projections. Uh, the key underlying reason there is steep decline in cost with demand estimates particularly revised up following successful subsidy free tenders in Germany and Netherlands in 2017 and 18. So looking in, in Europe, the cost of offshore wind is now uh, around 50 euros per megawatt hour for new developments, equivalent to 50 euro per kilowatt uh, for Norwegian, uh, in Norwegian terms, including transmission to shore. So that's down about 75% from a decade ago. And as shown in, the, in this graph, implies that the cost of building a new offshore wind farm is now substantially below simply the operating cost of coal and gas plants consisting of coal, gas and uh, CO2 costs. And they are the marginal producers that set electricity prices in Europe today. So offshore wind developers are not taking a bet on higher electricity prices. Economics are here will make sense also in an oversupplied uh, electricity market. Uh, do note that this is not completely comparing apples to apples though, so importantly it does not address the challenges of either storage or security of supply. Uh, they are also based on the current gas and coal plants uh, operating at full speed, which is optimistic, uh, particularly for coal. And we have not used the current elevated gas prices or assumed a further increase in the CO2 price, which is something we believe will be necessary to decarbonize other hard to abate sectors in the EU. A few things have driven this development. Most important is the availability of large dedicated offshore turbines. Uh, in addition, you have now a dedicated supply chain, uh, while uh, earlier uh, you had to rely on the oil and gas supply chain. Larger wind farms also drive economics of scale. So looking at projects sanctioned a decade ago, here illustrated with a wind farm of the Dutch coast sanctioned in 2012 and coming on stream in 2015, they effectively used onshore turbines. So this used a three megawatt onshore turbine from Vestas on top of an oil and gas substructure. Today, uh, the latest project in, of the Dutch coast uses an 11 megawatt turbine and, and has a dedicated supply chain. And larger turbines does two main things. It lowers the balance of plant or capex and opex. And the, this accounts for a much larger proportion of total cost offshore uh, than it does onshore, but it's largely incurred on a per turbine basis. So the vessel spread, the number of offshore procedures, cabling, maintenance and so forth is not determined by the production capacity of the wind farm, but by the number of turbines. So larger turbines means fewer, uh, larger turbines means fewer turbines. Uh, and uh, this significantly lowers cap capex and opex. The other key item is that onshore turbines are made for onshore wind conditions. Uh, so the capacity factor for the first um, wind farm here uh, was modeled around 35% on par with onshore. 
When we look at offshore wind farms today with modern turbines, they achieve production factors of 50% or more using uh, the next generation uh, turbines. And we're, we're just getting started there. So if you look on offshore wind turbine, Siemens Gamesa, uh, their first dedicated offshore uh, turbine is merely 10 years old. The first Vestas turbine came in operations no more than five years or, or so ago. Uh, so looking at the wind farms coming on stream in the next few years, they use turbines ranging from 8 to 13 megawatts. Meanwhile, uh, Vestas have already launched uh, a 15 megawatt platform available in 2024. And moreover, when we look at the dimensions of this turbine, it's, it's actually a 20 megawatt turbine. They simply can't market it as a 20 megawatt turbine just yet, as they don't even have the prototype on, on the water. They have to be conservative in their estimates. So this graph shows how the capacity rating of earlier models have been increased since first launched and the capacity rating relative to the swept area. And assuming a similar development here, we thereby already have a 20 megawatt turbine available in the market in the early second half of this decade. And further models will be announced by 2030. And this is not fully discounted in current uh, predictions, uh, which leads to a continued underestimation of the cost decline going forward in our view. Uh, the industry has also benefited from low cost of capital. So while varying widely based on the regulatory regime, we see an unlevered return requirement of around 5%, roughly half uh, just what it was just a few years ago. There's two, two things that have happened here. So you're benefiting from the general renewables trends. Uh, uh, renewables is capex heavy, uh, benefits from global yield compression. Uh, and we have seen compressed spreads from lenders, from equity markets looking to, uh, to green up their portfolios. In addition, and specifically for offshore wind, the industry has developed from being considered a risky niche with a handful of players uh, some years ago uh, to being a mainstream asset class with large infrastructure funds and, and more recently also the European oil majors uh, being key capital providers. So cost of equity, if anything, uh, in our view, is lower than it is uh, onshore, uh, where risk is higher due to uh, uh, opposition, local opposition. Uh, there are a few headwinds uh, at present as well, though. Uh, so firstly, as mentioned, uh, you benefit from lower, lower global yields. The momentum there might turn the other way around with rising inflation. And assuming a 1% increase in the capital cost of offshore wind project using a base of 5%, we estimate a 7% increase in the levelized cost of electricity due to uh, higher uh, interest cost. The other key issue at current is escalating raw material prices. A lot of steel, uh, as well as certain other high value materials, goes into construction of both the turbine and the foundation, while, for example, copper is required for cabling. Uh, while it's a lot of steel compared to the total value of a wind turbine, raw material accounts for a relatively small proportion. So in total, we estimate that, for example, steel accounts for 6% of the value of a generic offshore wind turbine, including a standard monopile foundation. So even assuming a doubling of certain commodity prices and assuming that's sustainable, we don't expect much more than a 10% increase in total capex. Still also sufficient to increase the, uh, the levelized cost of electricity by about 7% or similar to a 1% increase in capital cost. While a challenge, even a 14% uh, increase combining the two uh, is not sufficient to material, uh, materially alter economics. In regions such as Europe, renewables will continue to be cheaper than coal, with all other alternatives generally also suffering from increased capital and raw material costs. Uh, in addition, uh, the increase we're seeing here uh, is not more, much more than the average declining cost recent 10 years, primarily explained by technology improvement and lower uh, spreads. So while the relative decline uh, will decelerate, uh, these effects just only sets the industry back a year or two in terms of, of cost. And while definitely a headwind, uh, it won't uh, spoil the party. So with competitive cost, we expect market growth projections to be continue to be revised up. There's two main reasons for this. First and foremost, we need accelerated growth in renewable energy production to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Given the low cost, Increased renewables is also a relatively low-hanging fruit in the energy transition. Uh, models made by major consultancies such as DNV or IEA, Bloomberg, uh, on how to reach climate ambitions as efficiently as possible, all highlight increased renewable production as the first and, uh, and uh, most efficient way uh, to reduce emissions sufficiently by 2030. 
Depending on the path, we need to accelerate wind energy production around four times what's currently discounted in projections the next decade. And even in a low case scenario where we assume large scale adaption of, of carbon capture at fossil plants uh, or, or not yet, using not yet available nuclear uh, developments, uh, the, uh, the, the projected growth still has to accelerate two to three times. The second point for offshore wind is that uh, there's continued and spreading opposition against onshore wind. And we believe that the increasing competitiveness of, of offshore wind uh, gives a viable alternative in most places, such as in Norway. This could increase this opposition and lead to higher uh, offshore wind cannibalizing onshore wind growth, more than was currently expected. We do note, though, that we need both to meet uh, uh, our emission reduction target, as uh, highlighted earlier in this conference. Uh, the lead times for offshore wind are awfully long. Now looking at how this will play out for the offshore wind industry. The first thing that's clear to us is that the value of existing backlog and development size has increased substantially. This slide shows the price paid for the rights to explore development of offshore wind areas. Historically, these have been handed out for free. Exploration hasn't costed money in, in offshore wind. Uh, in 2018, the results of a site licensing round in Massachusetts, US, was a shock to the market, raising nearly three times uh, as much as uh, the, um, the licensing round for oil and gas blocks in the US GOM at the same point in time. And the recent uh, couple of years have seen shift dwarfing this. Late last year, BP agreed to purchase 50% of Equinor's offshore wind portfolio uh, in New York and Massachusetts for more than a billion dollars. So acknowledging that Equinor have worked some on the project in the meantime, this is equal to about 12 times the amount paid for Equinor to secure the areas just a couple of years in advance. Then the last bar here, which shows the estimated price paid uh, for sites in the uh, UK licensing round last year, where winning bids again ended up beyond anything seen before. Again, UK-based uh, major BP, now together with utility and BD, submitted the highest bid whereby they will pay the government around £160,000 per megawatt per year, simply for the right to develop a site of Wales. And with at least six years until the project is ready to start construction, if successful in submitting the winning bid in, an, in, a, in a government price auction, this will amount to more than €1 million Euro per megawatt, or some 40% of the complete project value. And this is paid in site fees alone, prior to knowing things such as uh, development costs or the price paid for the electricity produced. So with this in mind, it's quite clear that development rights secured for pennies a few years ago are incredibly valuable and that some will be super profitable in our view. Our second conclusion is that the days where more or less all developers are successful are probably over. So while return requirements have drop, uh, dropped, uh, risks have increased materially for uh, new projects. Now, will this stop here? Uh, Probably not in the very near term. What we believe is that higher oil and gas prices could actually push more capital into offshore wind uh, through accelerating oil majors' energy transition targets. So the graph on the left here shows the cash flow of oil majors. The graph on the right, their allocation to energy transition activities. Here, offshore wind generally plays a key, key role, being in the sub-segment where they can make use of their extensive offshore experience. Uh, so what we have seen in recent years is that higher earnings from oil and gas have not been used to increase oil and gas budgets. Meanwhile, capital allocated to energy transition activities have increased. So with the highest excess cash flow in more than a decade at current commodity prices, we expect their green push to be further accelerated in 2022. Is it impossible for a developer to make money? No, we don't think so. But with nearly abundant capital available, developer capabilities is increasingly important. There are still some greenfield sites available at low pricing where substantial value can be created. An example of this is the recent Scotland tender for new development sites of the Scottish coastline. In the auction, and unlike round four prices, uh, round four, prices were capped with a focus on developing the local industry rather than maximizing upfront profit. While the caps were increased tenfold following round four last, last year, the amounts paid for sites are still very modest and a fraction of uncapped auctions. So Scotland was therefore effectively a beauty contest where quality things such as local investment and innovation were key allocation criteria. So while the auction was originally intended to be for sites covering 10 gigawatt, it, it, it ended up awarding sites totaling 25 gigawatt according to developer plans. That's huge. Uh, to put it into context, if all this ended up being developed, 
This would equate to about 120 terawatt hours of electricity production. That's more than what was generated from fossil fuel plants in the UK in 2020, and some 20%, 40% of total power consumption in the year. And this is one of three siting, uh, licensing rounds in the UK uh, this year. The risk is high, high though. So firstly, uh, the Scotland acreage includes about 15 gigawatt of floating wind areas. So while we're very positive to the future of floating wind, this is still a sub-segment at its infancy with significant challenges to be tackled. Um, there is also, if all of this is awarded, a lack of grid capacity to the demand centers uh, on the south of, of the island. Uh, so, so there is government risk, uh, government investment required for all of this to uh, be developed. Finally, uh, the uh, 15 gigawatt uh, target compares with the government target of minimum uh, one gigawatt of floating wind by uh, 2030. So unless this is raised, which is something both we and probably developers in mind expect, projects will uh, have to effectively compete on cost with bottom fixed wind. Uh, and while that will be possible in the future, it could be difficult, if not impossible, within the 2030 timeframe, when most are planning start of uh, operations. Uh, uh, so developer capabilities are extremely important for the developers. Others that we believe are well positioned in the offshore wind industry is the turbine manufacturers. Uh, they account for the vast majority of OPEX and CAPEX. It's the nav of the industry that have really driven its development, while developers have reaped most of the benefits so far. They are involved from day one, being detrimental to economics and, and project designs. And unlike the developer side of the table, as shown on the left here, uh, the market is not getting crowded, within practice three suppliers outside of the semi-closed Chinese market. Uh, they are currently facing a uh, challenge margins though, which is due to shortages of certain raw materials and logistical issues. It is not related to pricing pressure, which has been the case in the past. So as this is increasingly uh, subsidy free, they have managed to raise prices uh, successfully passing on higher raw material prices to clients. So margins should improve once the market stabilizes, and this really shows their position uh, in the supply chain in our view. Uh, and while project developers are required to bid more aggressively, we see an increasing risk of bottlenecks and inflation. Conversely, for parts of the supply chain, we expect uh, improved market condition. This graph splits the positive revisions in market growth to 2030 into the first and second half of the decade. So as you can see, the entire upward revision here has been made in the second half. This is explained by the fact that the 2030 is a round number. Uh, governments are setting ambitions for 2030, while lead times are long. So the growth won't be gradual here. It will be a large step up in activity, a boom uh, from about 2025. Uh, and, and, and such a quick ramp, ramp up could lead to shortage of both uh, equipment and personnel. And based on learnings from similar periods in, in the oil and gas industry, it could reduce efficiencies and lead to unforeseen vessel requirements that put vessel owners in an excellent position. Particularly here, as day rates of installation vessels won't really move the needle in terms of overall project economics, unlike, uh, uh, unlike a delayed startup. Uh, so to conclude, uh, offshore wind is now a cost competitive, uh, well-established asset class. Looking at demand projections, they have been revised up recent years, uh, and we expect this to continue going forward. Uh, so far, developers have reaped uh, most of the benefits, uh, but going forward, we expect to, this to change, with particularly oil majors' strategic entry having made life harder for incumbent players. Uh, meanwhile, we do see an improvement for the supply chain, uh, with turbine manufacturers particularly well positioned in our view.